So we'll start the way we do each Wednesday night with a sitting period. So you can get yourselves comfortable enough to sit for about a half an hour. Just take your time finding some comfort for the body. You might just explore whether you have enough warmth or need another blanket. Or if you like the chair you're in or the spot on the floor. Don't be shy about really offering up a little bit of self-care. It's not against the rules, not against the Buddhist rules. can be nice to do a very short and simple exploration like this. There's all kinds of things we can learn about ourselves. Like one of those things might be that we're just fine, actually. We feel fairly content. We don't need more. How nice to realize that. And eventually what will happen naturally is that we'll commit. Commit to a posture, a location. And we can really get curious about this too, this commitment, what it's like to commit to something. Like for the next half hour, I'm just going to sit here and practice. And the commitment might feel like different, feel differently for each of us. Maybe it's just faint or subtle. Maybe there's some deep resolve. can sometimes feel like there's so much to do in our practice. We have to be so good, get it right. But we forget that the practice is actually doing us in some ways and whatever, you know, there are these elements of intention or faith agency that are here even without our noticing.
And we can just feel what it's like to be a human. Really not trying to get it right. But with every in breath and every out breath, just know what it's like to have a body, a sensitive body. And a sensitive heart. We're not even trying to notice subtle experience. We're just starting in the most obvious way. And being human is like this. Having a body is like this. Being sensitive is like this. And something might happen naturally. You might start to notice the breath. Or feel the warmth or the tingling or the heaviness of the body. We might notice that there's some fatigue, or some restless energy. It's all okay. We don't need to reject any part of our experience. Just following along and noticing what the mind is interested in knowing, not even giving it any direction. Like you have to notice the breath or don't forget sound. I'm just receiving any experience. It's with this intention to stay curious about what it means to be human what it's like to be human, what it's like to be sensitive, what it's like to have a body. It's in this cultivation of curiosity and interest that the practice unfolds.
There's nothing we have to do. What will happen naturally, this is cultivated and clarified with our intentions to be awake, to be present. Is that when the mind gets lost or swept away by thought or story or resistance or greed? Sort of mysteriously Awareness reappears. And in these moments, we can be delighted. Feel into the brightness of the moment. How clear things seem. Your experience that's here in the light of awareness. And just continue like this. Feeling into what it means to be human what it's like to be sensitive, what it's like to have a body.
and opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Go ahead and take a minute or two to stretch the body. You can move around, get up out of your seat if you'd like. All right, well, if you've been here previous weeks, you know that we've been working our way through this book, Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism by Tanisara and Kitty Saro. And uh, we're about, we're working our way through chapter 11 currently. So it's just a jumping off place and you don't have to follow along if you don't have to book, but I um, usually use the chapter as a jumping off place to share some reflections with the group. And so I'll do that again tonight, just kind of riffing off of what emerged for me when I read the chapter. And also just, you know, it's more than that because our life is so, as practitioners and as we're learning through this book, this contemplative journey to engagement, engaged Buddhism, of waking up to this really integrated path in this really integrated path. And so it's more than reading and studying, but it's, it's really feeling our way into our life. Like, oh, what does it mean to be a practitioner now? What does it mean to be a student of meditation, of mindfulness, of Buddhism even? in the context of our lives just as they are. And so I wanna talk a little bit tonight about samsara, this, uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what that means, this Pali word, uh, this Pali language was the language spoken at the time of the Buddha. Many of the, the teachings are translated from Pali. And so we get these words like samsara that are often so rich and there can be translated a variety of ways to help us kind of get a sense of what they really are pointing to. And the Buddhist texts are written in um, really interesting ways too. They're, the teachings are passed down orally and um, compiled and by use of often by use of similes and metaphors and analogies and stories and dialogue. So they're really, for me, it feels like they're meant for a creative exploration, a deep contemplation so that we go like, oh, what is, what is this word? What is, what's the depth of its meaning here and how does it apply? And what is the story, you know, that might feel like it's, you know, from a different a different time, and it is. And how does it apply? How does the teaching? What's the essence here? And how does it uh, apply in our life? And so, a recent, a more recent kind of description of samsara might be, you know, thought of as like a place. This this uh, samsara is like a uh, like this these cycles of suffering, not just in this life that we are taken have taken birth in, but also in these like moments where our minds get swept away and kind of reify a sense of self right there in, in a moment, like in the thoughts. And, you know, we've all probably had these experiences where we're like, oh my God, you know, that I was really swept away or caught in up in the suffering of the mind or my own limitations or something like that. And then we wake up and it feels like we've emerged from that that little mini cycle of samsara. So we might think of samsara as a place like this crazy world we live in or this crazy mind that we have. 
being maybe constantly bombarded by sense experience and all the ways that we seem to not be able to escape how the mind clings to everything all the things in the world that we get attached to but in earlier uh, in earlier times since since samsara can also be thought of as like the the root is it means to wander about so this kind of endless wandering this endless seeking something to make us happy. And, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> to wander, samsara, which is kind of taken and applied and we understand it as these little cycles of birth and suffering. And yet the word itself is to wander about. So what does that mean? And here again, it's meant to be evocative and not and not at all straightforward. So we get to be creative right here in this exploration of samsara. So wandering is like chasing something or this endless ambition, this getting stuck in cycles of doubt and indecision, thinking this new experience is really gonna make us happier. There's got to be something else out there to make me happy. And there's just so much wanting and wanting and wanting in our lives. So it's that really that compulsive seeking something else, another sense experience, another acquisition to make us happy. And isn't the way it is like for us, you know, I don't know about you, but I catch myself in this process all the time, like I'll looking for something, I'll feel, uh, uncomfortable in some way. And then immediately mind is like, well, maybe I'll make a fancy tea drink or I'll see what's in the refrigerator or I'll take a break from this boring work and read a couple of poems or maybe I'll just check the news, right? I don't know if you catch yourself doing this too, but just always like looking for something entertaining. I remember being on retreat once and kind of for a longer, longer duration. And I, before, I didn't even know it until I was midway through the shampoo bottle that I was reading the label <laughs> in the shower. Like, oh my gosh, just looking for some entertainment, something, something to save me. And maybe it'll be here in this, these words that I can't pronounce. And there's this Buddhist story that I've heard about this person who kept eating a bag of chili peppers one after one and kind of in this state of misery and somebody approaches and said well you know why are you doing that you're crying and in so much pain and and the person replies well i was told there was a sweet one in here isn't you know that's just such a great example just keep and how like we can relate to that now i mean you know we might not sit down to a bag of chili peppers but how many Netflix shows have we watched episode after episode and it's just mediocre, but there's something about that, you know, wanting to, well, maybe the next one will be better. Maybe it'll be a little bit better. Maybe it'll really deliver the goods. And then we find a show that's really good and then we get to the end of it. And oh, what a bummer. I wonder if there's another one out there, something like this. And the same kind of, you know, process is inherent in so many of the ways we live our lives, you know, looking for the next promotion or a better relationship or a new group of friends or a different world experience or to resolve some kind of dilemma, social dilemma. And thoughts can be like this too. We can look at our external world and see all the suffering and the endless wanting evident in our experience, habits around consumption or the way humans use power. And we can see just how problematic that is. But our, our thoughts about these experiences can also be a little mini cycle of samsara, like getting caught up and not liking something or hating the reality of things as if somehow we're gonna uh, we're going to uh, solve the problem of samsara.
And for most of us, we're not, we're not trying to deal with samsara by stepping out of life. We're trying to deal with samsara that's a reality of how limiting that, that greed motivated seeking is, that it's always limiting. Even when something is satisfying for a moment, then it ends and here we are again with the same dilemma. So we're not trying to resolve the problem of sam samsara in our life by stepping out of life for most of us, most of the time. And there are some ways that we can find some relief and that relief can be found like coming to a program at Common Ground or sitting for a half a day or going on a longer retreat or something like this. But this relief is really because we're setting something down, simplifying our experience so that we can see more clearly how this works. They're like, oh, sweetie, it doesn't make sense to keep reading shampoo bottles. At some point, you're just gonna have to deal with the dis discomfort. So even if we find some skill at setting things down, finding some seclusion, finding some rest and rejuvenation and practice or in retreat or in simplification, these are all wonderful ways to do our lives. At some point we're gonna re-enter, right? And we're gonna still be who we are and our lives are gonna, we're gonna work at the places we work and our friends and our people are gonna be our friends and our people. And we're gonna have to deal with the, you know, the problems that exist, the way the mind gets caught up in all of this seeking. We're still gonna have to do our life. I'm gonna have to walk my dog. We're gonna have to eat. We're gonna have to take care of the body. And so if we, at some point, this seeking doesn't make much sense. And this is, you know, what Buddhist teachers sometimes talk about surrendering. Like this kind of surrendering is like, ah, oh, I cannot, there's no, you know, it's not even a worthwhile experience to try to somehow resolve the problem of sam samsara. Perhaps it's better just to deal with it and see if there's a way to understand what it means to be human and relate to our experiences, our lives, our personalities, each other in a more useful way, in a more sustaining way. It doesn't mean that chocolate stops being good. I still love chocolate. And I love a good tea drink, <laughs> but you know, when I'm drinking tea or when I'm eating chocolate, I want to also have some resolve to be curious about the experience that perpetuates that endless seeking. So has anybody been watching the jury selection process or following along here? Yeah. And how about reading the chat while doing so? That's another level, isn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's been a great way for me to observe samsara and to drop into this inquiry that Kitty Sara proposes that came from his teacher, Ajahn Chah. I'll read a bit about that later, but with this one simple question, is this heavy? Is this heavy? Like, is there another way to relate here? What's happening? Is it just an acquisition of information? Is it just more greed fueled, greed fueling this kind of habit of consumption? Like I need to consume this media. I need to consume this jury selection process. Is it, or is there a more skillful, healthier way to relate to this experience of being right in the middle of the collective, being a participant in this community, this community that we call life, this human. And it's not even a Minneapolis thing because the whole world has their eyes on this jury selection process and the trial of and Chauvin's trial currently. So it's like, it's been a really interesting and I, I can't say that I've got it mastered but there are moments when this heart knows that it doesn't have to reject something in order to know relief. 
And it seems to be right in those moments of feeling some kind of heart pain, like right in the middle of the rejection that the heart learns how to let go of that. Or right in the middle of this disconnection when the heart learns how to question that. Like, oh, is there any kind of connection to what's happening here? Or right in the middle of this numbness, like not landing, that the heart knows how to drop that. So instead of trying to transcend suffering, to get to another place, to get to another, to transcend samsara, to try to get to a different place, we can try to understand what's happening right here so that we have more expression, more expressions of freedom available to us. And in order to learn how to live skillfully, we're gonna need a lot of strategies. I was walking my dog earlier like I normally do, even though it's a bit rainy, she doesn't really like it. Shorter walk today. And she was, you know, it's spring and been noticing this for a week or so that it's very exciting to go outside right now. You know, all the smells and the warmth that's pleasant, it has been pleasant here. And she can like get really absorbed into a smell and get interested in that. And then sometimes get swept away by the, the wind and will just like wanna dart across the street and like from one smell to another. And it was like, oh yeah, this is what samsara is like. Like I can't even enjoy this smell because there's a better one across the street, I better go. Right? And so one of the useful strategies can be that same strategy that I might, and that role that I might play with my beloved four-legged companion is like, no, sweetie, just stay here. Just stay here. But sometimes it can be really useful as a strategy for training this heart how to belong in this moment. Is that like, no, sweetie, I'm not going to give myself an out right now. It's like that kind of commitment and resolve when we've found a posture that we're going to sit in for the next half an hour. It's no small thing. It's really very profound. Like, oh, I'm just going to not move here. I'm just going to accept this. And it can be a, a useful strategy to, to back up or back out. You know, sometimes that, that heat, it feels too much. Right? I don't know, you know, you probably all had this experience too while in the middle of a, in the middle of a discussion or in the middle of a, a significant feeling in the heart, like this feeling of tension or restlessness that doesn't seem to want to break and it can so easily sweep us away. Sweep us away, then the mind gets lost in worrying about it or doubt or somehow it just feels like that anxiety or whatever the inner experience is, is growing, it's strengthening. And so to make a skillful choice, like I'm going to back out of this right now, I'm going to back up. I'm going to open my eyes, I'm going to choose another activity. I'm going to ask my friend to have this conversation on a different day. I'm going to make a change. And that, you know, is a, a really can be a good and useful thing to do. Like, how do we stay in our lives? Oh, by using some of these strategies. And there are a couple of like, there's always a shadow to these things, right? We can convince ourselves that we need to back out because it's unpleasant, because the heat is unpleasant, when really we have the capacity to actually be right there and feel it and learn something about our courage. It's a lot that can be learned that way. And so that's a process of discernment where wisdom helps us understand when it's useful to make a change. 
And there are ways that we can check to see if our strategies are working. We're not gonna get it right, but we have each other. So we can use our friends, we can stay in relationship, a willingness to be engaged with each other so we can say like, hey, what do you notice? Are there any shadows here? And sometimes uh, an honest inquiry is just the thing that our friends, our partners, our family needs to be able to give us uh, some direct feedback. Like, hey, I, I felt something when I said that thing. How did it feel to you? Oh, it felt fine to me. It didn't feel off. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. There's some confidence now. And we can check to see if our strategies are working another way is just to see if we're able to be mindful. Because it might be unpleasant, but if the heart can stay connected, then that's great. Sometimes in the samsara of distraction, the heart can't, There's, it doesn't wanna connect. You know, it wants to avoid sensitivity bouncing from one news outlet to another, reading something, multitasking, checking the phone. You know, like there's just a kind of disconnection that's felt there. Oh, not able to really stay with this experience. Not able to know, not able to track. And that's good information. So perhaps it might be wise to do something else. Slow down, take a few breaths. Choose a different way to do life in this moment. And another way to check to see if our strategies are working is are we able to live ethically? Like, do we know what our values are and are, is it possible to live them out? I know for me and for many people I've talked to, it, when life gets more chaotic and frantic, then it feels harder to make the right choice. It feels easier to be sloppy. And that doesn't feel good. Right? So a strategy is like, oh, what do I care about? And can I honor that? Can I really, can I be careful when I'm walking to not injure plants? Or am I in such a rush that I just don't care, I'm not thoughtful. I would, uh, my mother-in-law passed away in May and my partner and I have spent a lot of time in Michigan with my father-in-law since then um, and some time with them both before Dorothy's passing. And there was this little corner of the kitchen that when I would wake up, there would be like a little collection of ants there and so it was part of my daily routine to get a little water and clean up anything around the ants. And I would notice that on there were some days where I felt burdened with duties, like my work was gonna, needed to start right away. And I was a little sloppy and I injured ants and killed some and it didn't feel good, but it was a lesson like, oh, sweetie, you know, be careful, the strategy is not working right now. And when the answer is no like that, then we can just try something else, like perhaps taking a deep breath or trying something else. And so you might just you know, reflect on that something else right now. What strategies do you use to stay sensitive when you feel off? And that off feeling, this is what the Buddha called dukkha. And again, another analogy, the, the Buddha used this analogy of like a wheel and the center, the hole is not quite 
you know, on the axle. And so it kind of clunks along, clunks along, making a unpleasant sound. But the wheel keeps going, right? It just is not a good fit. So we can keep going in our life. Our lives are gonna keep moving forward. It's just not a good fit. That, that off feeling, we can ignore it and we'll still, and then, you know, it will have some impact on how we live, on our relationships, on our work, on how we spend our time, on our, how we treat ourselves and each other. But when we take care of that off feeling, then it also has an impact on how we live and how we relate to each other and how we do our work and how we engage. And this is from Joseph Goldstein. He says the word dukkha is made up of the prefix du and the root ka. Du means bad or difficult and ka means empty. Empty here refers to several things, some specific, others more general. One of the specific meanings refers to the empty axle hole of a wheel. The ac if the axle fits badly into the center hole, we get a very bumpy ride. This is a good analogy for our ride through samsara. Like it's bumpy. It is bumpy. And so the strategies that we use to relate wisely to this experience of samsara are really important. I run, I once, designed an entire website during a retreat day. It was during a, a 10 day retreat and it came to mind and I just gave into it. It was like very exciting. <laughs> and the mind was just looking for an out like of this work, this it's hard work to live skillfully. It's hard work to use the strategy. It's hard work to keep watching it's hard to work to care about our ethics. So this mind just gave into it, like looking for something entertaining, juicy, and not even noticing that this non-mindful indulgence was just another samsara. It's like samsara is like this, you know, another way that the Buddha talks about suffering is like a river that's flowing on and on and on. And this experience of samsara is like this ignoring of the suffering that's here like because this mind gets so used to that this numbing or seeking these greedy habits aversive habits that it just learns how to you know pursue and not feel so this river flowing on and on and on is like always another possibility and then Yeah, we jump on one experience or another and ride on it for a while until we look for something more. And thoughts, like planning a website, thoughts like this are wildly entertaining. And this is why I gave the experience of planning into the experience of planning because it was satisfying until it wasn't. And so I got to the end of my website and then what was left was this feeling of tension. It's like, oh, all in the body and the mind. And there was this conditioned experience that that indulgence gave birth to. And that was this like wanting to get the hell out of this body and heart, wanting to look for something else. It was really unpleasant and that feeling that, oh, this doesn't feel good. It was really, uh, it was significant. And perhaps because I was on retreat and had spent some days already cultivating this habit of awareness, but it felt so intense. And in that moment of feeling, oh, this doesn't feel good. The heart knew like, oh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to just let the mind go and not watch. It's not that having thoughts is the problem, right? It's not being mindful of them. Letting just spin and spin and spin. 
One of my favorite similes that I've mentioned before is this very simple story when someone comes to the Buddha and says, well, how did you cross the flood? And the Buddha replies, without tarrying and without hurrying, did I cross the flood? So again, this water analogy to point to suffering or beg our curiosity about what the Buddha is pointing to here in this use of a simile. The Buddha's response, without tarrying, friend, without hurrying, did I cross the flood of suffering? By not halting and not straining, the steady perseverance, steady perseverance. And the, the Buddha goes on to say, you know, so the friend goes, well, well, yeah, but, you know, how did you do it? And the Buddha says, well, when I hurried, when I tarried, I sank. And when I hurried, then I got swept away. And so I learned by not tarrying and not hurrying that I crossed the flood. And it's not, it's like right here in the middle of this simple story that we can see, oh, the Buddha is in the middle of life, in the middle of suffering not transcending suffering or somehow getting out of our life, but it's right here in this experience of tension, this feeling of it doesn't feel good, this embodied feeling of tension. That's the suffering that causes us to get off the wheel for a moment. And it's cultivated this capacity to get off the wheel is really cultivated slowly with time and patience. The mind learns how to kind of stably rest and surrender, learns how to rely on sensitivity, care about that. I care more about sensitivity. I care more about the sensitive heart than I do about acquiring, consuming, jury information. Although it's nice to have information, the relationship to knowledge is important. The relationship to thoughts, the relationship to what we hear is what helps us build a capacity to be decent and skillful humans. So going back to the trial for a second or the jury selection process, you know, I really want to be able to receive the trial and the responses, all the responses to the trial wholeheartedly. And so this is the intention that I try to remember each moment when I'm looking at the news or listening to Unicorn Riot on Facebook, stream the selection process. And I have to accept that this heart has a lot of built-in dodges to avoid what feels unpleasant or uncomfortable. And so because I really care wholeheartedly about being sensitive through the whole trial, I'm gonna really watch. And so just a moment to land with that intention, like I really wanna be wholehearted. And so I'm gonna care more about sensitivity than I am going to be about acqu acquiring acquisition, acquiring information or something. And so then to, today I was just noticing all of the, the built-in dodges. <laughs> and I want to illustrate, Resma Menachem uses this word dodges, like dodges, ways that the heart tries to escape being close, being intimate, being sensitive. And so here's a little bit about, here's a little bit of what I noticed just today, just in a very short period of time. Going numb, blaming, wanting, wanting, wanting to predict how a juror will uh, see the evidence. Distraction by multitasking ignoring because I didn't understand the legal process and like, ah, oh, I don't understand. I'm just going to ignore it. 
trusting a form formalities rather than a subjective experience. I watch that happen. And not trusting my own ability to understand because of all the privileges I've had, including the privilege of whiteness. And I sort of scrolled some of these things down and then was like, oh God, these are the hindrances that just express themselves in these very nuanced ways, right? Going numb, dullness, blaming, aversion, wanting, wanting, wanting to predict how the juror is gonna see the evidence, wanting, distraction by multitasking, restlessness, ignoring something because I don't understand, more dullness, not trusting my own capacity to receive and synthesize the information, doubt. Right? So these five hindrances are dodges of sorts. They keep us from stability. And it's when these hindrances are stronger than the force of mindfulness that they sweep us off our feet and keep us in the flood or in the river. So just to be really direct about these five hindrances that we can know in all kinds of ways, the incessant wanting mind, the mind that doesn't want or is aversive in all kinds of ways, restlessness and worry, dullness, sleepiness, apathy, and doubt. Right? So there are obviously so many different expressions of each of these. And it's actually, you know, right here when the heart is courageous enough to admit this is what's going on. Oh, this is a dodge. Look at that. Hindrance at work. Then, you know, we learn how to not take it so personally. It's not personal. It's just a part of the process. Lapse in mindfulness. Heart's not completely, you know, stable. There's perhaps not a pattern or steady flow of mindfulness. Wisdom's not strong enough. These are all just, nat this is nature. So the practice is about cultivating mindfulness so that we can see this process, maintain our sensitivity and have a fighting chance of having some agency or choice in our lives that will help us live out our values, live out our ethical commitments to ourselves. And when we consider, you know, what it means to be responsive citizens and um, connected colleagues and sensitive friends to each other, we want to find some way to tap into this persevering energy, this wholehearted, this uh, capacity to not burn out, to somehow like screw it. I'm gonna, you know, rely on something satisfying until it's no longer satisfying. That kind of persevering energy that allows us to see these cycles of samsara that we find ourselves in over and over and over again. So how is it possible to find that persevering energy, to tap into that persevering energy, this wholehearted that allows us to stay engaged wholeheartedly? And it's, it's really this willingness to set down our attachments and how is that possible? Well, it's possible because we understand samsara. Samsara is almost always paired with nibbana. So the Buddha said I, that he taught one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. And I always thought that was kind of funny, like, well, isn't that two things? But samsara is this endless seeking in ways that don't serve us. And this nibbana or these moments of freedom that we can even taste in our daily lives are a dropping of that. So it doesn't mean that we no longer have thoughts or we no longer care. We can't somehow have to get out of our lives or live on retreat. You know, it's not that at all. It's like this inquiry is this heavy. And how do we set that down so that we can continue 
to be engaged. And I'm not suggesting this is easy. It's not easy for me, but this is the work. This is the work of practice. And we can take our cues from wise beings all around us. I don't know if you've um, seen or heard the Dalai Lama, but he laughs a lot. And, you know, suffering is no stranger to him. It's not like the conditions of our lives are so radically different. You know, there's suffering all over the world. And when we look, we can see, oh, this whole world is samsara. So much suffering, so, so much suffering. And yet this capacity to laugh is there. And we can notice this in our own lives too, when there's a bit of, ah, a, an ability to appreciate something. Even the capacity to stay connected during difficult moments. So this persevering energy is possible because of letting go, like learning that there's no need to cling to anything and that this cultivation of a sensitive heart is more important than trying to resolve this um, problem of samsara. And it doesn't actually mean that we have to reject samsara, right? It's like the Buddha learn to cross the flood in the middle of the flood. And actually think this is what the, the teaching, you know, that I mentioned last week, if you were here, that there's this moment when after the Buddha's awakening, after enlightenment or Nibbana, that a person passed and asked him something like, who are you? And he replied in a formal way like with the description, a formal description, something like I'm the Tathagata, the fully awakened, a fully awakened being. And the person wasn't at all interested, like didn't get it and just kept walking. So the Buddha made an adjustment. And so this is what I think, you know, is kind of the depth of that teaching right there he was able to correct and stay engaged in teaching with his kind of activism because he didn't beat himself up. He didn't spend like, oh, you know, I feel so bad or, you know, that was a terrible thing. And what do I need to, you know, didn't get caught up in this proliferation. He wasn't attached to getting it right or not getting it wrong. And this is a key right here to wholehearted engagement or this persevering energy, this willingness to just go like, oh yeah, samsara is like this. Dukkha is like this. Not feeling connected is like this. Not wanting this to be this way is like this. And in that moment, there can be some space enough to keep going. The Buddha could have hung it up like, oh, forget it. These people with little dust in their eyes, they're never going to get this. I'm going to sit under a tree and enjoy my enlightenment. But no, he cared. He cared about people. He cared about helping. He cared about service. And this is, yeah, can be really important for us to hear. Can we care about helping? Can we care about service? Can we care about a kind of compassionate response that just flows naturally out of our hearts when we don't hold back. This is a bit from the chapter. This is Kitty Sorrow. He says, once Ajahn Chah, who was his teacher, uh, and a great uh, master. Once Ajahn Chah was walking with his disciples when he pointed to a very large boulder and said, is it heavy? Looking over at the huge rock, the monk said, yes, it's really heavy. Ajahn Chah smiled and said, 
It's not heavy if you don't pick it up. Right where it's heavy, we discover release. In this way, Ajahn Chah showed us how suffering and the end of suffering are found in the same place. We extinguish fire at the place at which it appears. Whenever it is hot, that's where we can make it cool. And so it is with enlightenment. Nibbana is found in samsara. Enlightenment and delusion exist in the same place, just as, just as do hot and cold. It's hot where it was cold and cold where it was hot. When heat arises, the coolness disappears. And when there is coolness, there's no more heat. In this way, Nibbana and Samsara are the same. It's learning not to hold back. Staying connected, trusting sensitivity more than consumption. Thanks for listening, everyone. We have a little bit of time. I'd love to hear from someone else. And as always, you don't have to be smart or enlightened. <laughs> Just have something to contribute to our collective learning. Feel free to unmute yourself when the time is right. If you'd like to say your name and what pronouns you use, that would be great. And then offer your reflection or question. It's always fine. Criticisms, disputes, keep things fun and interesting. That's a really good question, Junie. Yeah, like just going back to those, the strategies that we use, that there are many of them. I just named a few, but there are many of them. And some of them, you know, sometimes the right medicine is a lot of love or a lot of self care or, you know, a stepping out of the fire. You know, so we have to really be willing to ask, you know, if this is heavy, well, what, what is needed to put it down? And it might be like, oh, hi, I just would feel better if I could take a bath and feel the warm water or something. And, you know, there's always, there's a place for pleasant experience, an important place for pleasant experience. So we don't want to be afraid, right? And have to, like, we have to walk some prescripted path. We get to be creative. And, you know, it can seem like sometimes, well, this is, there's no changing this predicament. Like the mind is sticky, it's getting, just absorbed by every little thing. And so as the, when, you know, we don't have the option of taking a bath or applying a different strategy that might be useful, then the only thing we're left is with this kind of sticky situation. And so then, well, what do we do now? And so is there a way to relate to that reality with a little more kindness? You know, like, I'm just not gonna fight this. I'm gonna watch and appreciate that this is the way it is. It's lawful. You already know that there are some reasons, some reasons that we know, you know, often it's like this, some reasons that we know and some reasons that we don't know. So a bit of it is mysterious and a bit of it can be known, you can understand some of the causes and conditions, but it doesn't change the, you know, that this is the way it is. Even when we understand the condition, sometimes this mind is just anxious and I don't know why. And it doesn't seem to shift even though, even when I do a lot of things right, there's just like a seed of anxiety that's just waiting to be birthed. And so 
the only thing I can do is just to accept that that's the way it is and see if I can relate to that with a bit of kindness, love and understanding like, oh, this is not personal. It's this way for a reason. I don't understand what those reasons are, but I know it's not gonna help by fighting or hating it. It's nine o'clock, time to say goodbye, but not before Patrice dedicates the merit for us. Oh, <clears throat> let's all participate in this um, wonderful act of beautiful ritual, a wonderful act of imaginative generosity. If there's any goodness to our practice tonight, any merit, any benefit, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We'd give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our community, persons we like, persons we don't like, persons we know, and all the persons we don't know. And in addition to the two-legged, we'd give it to the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slithery, all beings everywhere. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. Amen. Thank you. Thanks to you all for being here. Be good to yourselves.